and welcome to Publishing Insight, an interview podcast about working in publishing. I'm Flavia, your host, and this is the first episode of season two. Before introducing my very first guest for this new season, I'd like to announce that Publishing Insight finally has a website. You can visit it at www.publishing-insight.com. For any comments or feedback, you can write me an email at publishinginsight at gmail.com or get in touch on Twitter and Instagram at flamflam91, flam, flam91. Publishing Insight is an independent project, so if you'd like to support it, you can donate on Coffee. All the links are in the description box of the podcast and on the website. And now, on to the interview. This interview was recorded in January 2020, and my guest is Georgina Atwell, founder of Topsta, the biggest review and recommendation platform for children's books in the UK. Before creating Topstar, Georgina worked at Penguin, DK and Apple. We talked about many things, including working on digital products in publishing versus at a tech company, how the idea for Topstar came about, what are the mission and business model of our company, what are the most important steps to develop a new product. She also gives advice for people applying to entry-level roles in digital departments in publishing, talks about current trends in children's literature and recommends some of her favorite titles. Happy listening! Today my guest is Georgina Atwell, founder of Topsta, the biggest review and recommendation platform for children's books in the UK. Hi Georgina, and thank you very much for agreeing to be on the podcast. Hi there, delighted to be here. Thank you. So I will just start with the first question. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about your academic and career path so far? Uh, Of course. Uh, On paper, it looks fairly straightforward. I went to Edinburgh and studied English literature. I did the graduate scheme at Penguin and then worked in Penguin and DK for 10 years. And then I ran the ebook store for Apple uh, before then starting Topster. The reality is, as always, it wasn't quite that smooth. I was rejected from Cambridge and therefore tried for Edinburgh. The only reason I went for the Penguin graduate scheme was I applied for the FT graduate scheme and they basically laughed and said I should be trying for their sister company, Penguin. It hadn't occurred to me. Um, And then I was made redundant by Penguin and whilst um, on maternity leave, I was approached by Apple for a job. So it's nowhere near as linear as it might look on paper, but it's uh, looking back, it all it all seems to make sense. Great, thank you. <laughs> and as you said, you have worked on ebooks at Penguin and then at Apple. What are the main differences culturally and in terms of operative processes of working at digital products in a publishing firm versus in a tech company? I think that's a really interesting question because when when you start your first job, as I did at at Penguin and DK, you think that's the norm. So I had 10 years there and I thought this was A, indicative of publishing across the board and B, of businesses in general. Um, But it was only when I moved to Apple and really worked in my second company that I looked back and I could see how distinctive the culture was at Penguin and in publishing versus outside of Penguin and publishing. So, for example, in publishing, we spent a huge amount of time in meetings. There was decisions by groups so everyone had to agree um, you know whether it was in a a cover meeting or um, an acquisitions meeting people across different territories and different departments had to agree before things would progress it was predominantly female um, certainly down the sort of lower echelons as well Uh, it was very much creative first and then technology second Um, and uh it was it was a very wonderful place to work and I have good friends uh, who I've kept in touch with over the years but it was only when I moved to Apple which was very much um individual responsibility so I was the books person there and if there was a books question someone came to me to ask the question I gave the answer and that was decision made there were fewer decisions by committee uh, it very much at iTunes reflected the local editorial choices Um, So that meant that things happened a lot faster instead of having to get everyone in a room, which in itself takes time and then get everyone to agree. 
it was one question, one answer, and then moved on. So it worked in these very interesting kind of verticals of music and apps and books, etc. Um, and those all progressed quite rapidly. Um, it was also much more male uh, than I'd experienced at uh, Penguin. And it was fascinating just being often the only woman in a, in a meeting and the only woman sort of at that editorial level as well. And it was all about scale. So whereas Penguin was, was quite sort of focused on individual books um, on Apple, it was, all, it was a lot about reach and how you could do something that was going to reach the, the most amount of people. And it was, uh, it was really tech first and creative second in terms of that's how the business had started. But what I think was in common between the two was actually it was editorial first. What I loved about iTunes and when they first rang me up and told me about the job and that they were opening an ebook store, they made it very clear that the book of the week, the features on iTunes were um, determined through editorial judgment rather than payment, which is actually how most bookshops act and you know you get your placement in the store because you've paid for it and at Apple you had none of that and that was really the appeal originally um, so although they were in some ways very very different environments they put editorial uh, creativity at the heart of their businesses and that was very appealing. That's really interesting thank you very much <laughs> yeah. and can you tell us about Topstar and how the idea came about? Well, as I was saying at the start, it, it probably looks very straightforward, my progression from English literature to Penguin through to Topster via Apple. But actually, um, I was made redundant on my first maternity leave and I decided then that I wanted to run my own business. And I started looking for ideas and uh, I came up with, with what I thought were great ideas that clearly on um, inspection were not such great ideas in terms of business um, Uh, progress but I happened to be visiting two friends in Manchester and I had my little son who was about one years old at the time and uh, they had very kindly left out a pen and paper for him to practice his writing and had these beautiful glass objects all over the floor and I realized that in about 30 seconds flat those glass vases were going to be smashed <laughs> and and the chances of him practicing his letters aged one or two <laughs> were really very slim so a penny kind of dropped and I realised that actually unless you had children or unless you had children of a similar age, you really had no idea what children were into at various different stages. So the original idea was really books and toys. And I started what is now known as Topster, the website and putting it all together and had just launched it um, when I got a call from Apple saying we are launching an ebook store. And the reason they called me is um, about five years earlier they'd approached me for another job and I turned it down but I'd said to them uh, said to their very excellent HR department it's not the right job but if you ever start an ebook store that's the job I would love to do and this very clever smart lady called Fiona in the HR team remembered that conversation called me up and within about two weeks of our conversation on my um after my redundancy I started to work at Apple oh. and so it was it was pretty fast so um I I started Apple and I had five fantastic years there, but I said as I joined, I said, one day I will leave because I've got this business idea that I want to go back to. And I think they thought that was a lovely idea, but, you know, don't worry about it. And after five years, I decided it was time. Um, by then, not, not through any kind of deliberate strategy, but actually having made contact with all these UK publishers, I understood better how the industry worked outside of Penguin, what indie authors were doing. Um, and I and I knew the people who worked in all the different publishing houses, so it was a lot easier then to go back to the top store and get it going. Decided to cut out the toys bit and just focus on books. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and what are the mission and vision behind Top Star? It, it's pretty straightforward in terms of trying to get kids reading, and all the evidence suggests that those children who read for pleasure, a read for life, i.e. they don't stop reading when you take the pressure off, but equally are more successful in, in whatever terms you care to measure that in, sort of me mental health um, and, and career progression. You know, reading for pleasure really is, is the key. Um, and I think what I really wanted to do was to reach beyond what the industry calls sort of traditional readers, you know, very nice middle-class families within the M25, or at least close to London, um, who grew up with books at home, with parents who read in front of them, having books at home, libraries, bookshops, etc. nearby, and sort of 
um, really connect with families who didn't have any of that. So it started on Facebook because instead of trying to capture people as they walked into a bookstore who were or who were actively looking for books, I wanted to connect with families who were just on social media scrolling scrolling through their Facebook data sort of while pushing their kid in the park and really try to get books into those houses and even now we get emails saying this is the first book we've ever had at home which I think um, we're sitting here in my office surrounded by books for families who've grown up with books at home that is extraordinary um, but really very important and I wanted to do it in a really fun light touch way so I never use the word literacy but that's what it's about it's literacy and I didn't want to be a charity because I knew having worked in charities previously that you spend a huge amount of time applying for grants waiting and that can be very time consuming so I wanted it to be a commercial enterprise but with a sort of social enterprise at heart. That's great and what is the business model of the platform? I meet with publishers once or twice a year they present their their season's books and we talk about which ones would then be most appropriate for our platform. So I often say, um, although we have a, a large community, probably only a small portion are sort of the really high-end, literary end of children's books. They like a lot of commercial uh, books, books that they might see in the supermarket, books that they might see talked about um, by people on television, etc. You know, uh, authors such as David Williams who have a presence outside of um, the sort of literary world. And um, once they presented the books, we talk about which ones would be appropriate. And then we have various levels of kind of promotion that they can pay for. So that really funds it. Um, but there's not a huge amount of money in children's books marketing. So they're all kind of quite micro payments. And it means that smaller publishers and indie publishers and indie authors can afford it, as well as the big publishing houses who might want to put a package together. Perfect, thank you. And so in practicality, what does a typical day as the founder of Topstar look like? Ooh, um, uh, it's that classic thing. No two days are the same. I answer a lot of messages and emails. So um, whether that's through somebody who wants to know how to sign up to Topstar, somebody who has won a giveaway and wants to know where the book is, a publisher who's got a new book, a new publisher who wants to understand how we work. Um, I have various members of the team who are both based, based in the UK and abroad, and, and we communicate in terms of different projects that we're working on. Uh, a lot of reading, and um, I get various packages delivered daily, and I go and collect those from a local post box. Um, and that takes up a huge amount of my time. And I have to feel confident about promoting a book, having read at least a large chunk of it before I would then say, do you know what, this is right for our, for our audience. Um, we try and work far in advance, but uh, that only works a certain amount of the time. So at the moment we're in January and I am planning right the way through up to publishers who presented their titles through to December. But equally, you know, a, an email will come in. There's a new book on the on the schedule. Can we fit it in? And we kind of have a chat about what we can do. So um, it, it's a lot of email. It's a lot of reading. It's a lot of phone calls. Um, and and it's a lot of planning. I mean, I think that's the, the interesting thing about publishing. When you think about going into publishing, you think about reading books and that, yeah. you, think, you know, and editing and that you think that does the majority. And there's a lot of admin I think mm -hmm. with publishing because partly because there are so many books so you have to sort of track the progress for each of those books and we have um, generally we would have one giveaway a day so that in theory would be 30 different campaigns and I know for a fact in January we've got 87 we've got wow. 87 <laughs> books that we're juggling and they all have different elements so sometimes it's a school's bias we might focus on Twitter sometimes it's a parent's bias we might focus on our Facebook community Uh, it might be about showing the inside spreads, it might be about having an extract, it might be about an author interview. So there's hundreds of different elements um, that are kind of coming up each day and it's about managing and tracking those day to day. This is really fascinating, thank you. <laughs> and what is your favourite project you have worked on at Topsa? Oh, that's a tough one. It's, about, it's like choosing your favourite child. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I can do it. Um, oh... 
it's been incredible seeing the growth. I still have people who were there on the very first few days on Facebook back in 2014 who are still actively engaged with us. Both because the website. you started on Facebook. I started on Facebook before the website was launched. We had a year on Facebook um, and that's been really fun. But I guess in terms of a specific project, it's our printed reading record. So um, once a year, we print 30,000 copies of a reading record. And I don't know if you haven't got kids, it may not may not be obvious what a reading record is but when you're in the early years at school you have this book that travels between home and school and you have a book that you read and the child reads and you might say we read three pages today and uh, these were the words that uh, we didn't know before and we looked at what they meant and we enjoyed reading or we found it a bit hard and it travels back and forth and they might do a bit of reading at school and a bit at home so we create these reading records which is a, which is a diary but sort of um, scattered through the reading record we have reviews from children saying I love this book and I'm age seven and this is what I loved about it or we might sort of tell them about new books that are coming out that we think they might like and those are very carefully chosen um, and I think at a time when schools are under such pressure with resources and teachers are under a huge amount of pressure to sort of tick boxes and get everything done um, for Ofsted etc to be able to provide a free resource that um, a saves the school money Uh, B helps children to find great books and uh, C sort of helps spread the word of Topster has been really exciting and we've been doing that for two years now and publishers are brilliant about um, understanding what we're looking for and, and why we do it so I guess that's in terms of a discrete project the thing I'm most proud of uh, but actually just getting a, a business off the ground is is a huge amount of work and still surprises me now. Yeah absolutely <laughs> And in your opinion, what are the most important steps or elements to develop a new platform or digital product and make it grow? I read quite an interesting book, uh, which is well known, called The Lean Startup when I was first starting out. And I think that really gave me the blueprint for Topster, um, consciously or subconsciously. So it was all about starting small, launching, getting feedback, changing according to that feedback, launching again. And that's really what I did. So launching on Facebook, I understood that things like, I tried to be really arty in the beginning, uh, possibly sort of before Instagram really took off, and I would sort of design these beautiful pictures of the book and on the table with, you know, um, accompaniments and, and soft furnishings and pine cones and everything. Anyway, they hated that. They really hated oh, that. No. <laughs> All that effort. Um, and they really said, we just want to see the book cover. And so I started just showing a 2D book cover. And then one publisher said, can we show the 3D book cover? And I said, sure. And then we posted that. And a few other times, and they hated that as well. They really felt like we were dumbing down, like they didn't understand it was a book cover or, you know, that they, we, they didn't understand the thickness of the book. And so we, we tend to see a poor engagement level with 3D book covers than we do with 2D book covers. Um, and so gradually over time, I realized that I would take all of this information and I would put it into... The website so we wouldn't have 3d book covers we wouldn't try and do funny sort of gifts or animated covers or anything they just wanted to see the book cover and in a sort of high high number of pixels really large blown up it still worked um they didn't want to have too much text about the book they wanted a little bit of information about the story the name of the author and the age range and so we try and keep the facebook post particularly relatively short uh, twitter obviously has its own restrictions and sometimes i find that's not enough space in order to conclude what you yeah. want to include um but facebook we also try and keep those relatively short and also to have a question in there they enjoyed responding to a question so whether it's um you know who would you give this book to and why or what other books for this age group would you recommend or who's your favorite illustrator um they really enjoyed engaging with something there so I think when you're launching a digital product, it's really important not to sort of spend two years on it and then launch because you could be going completely down the wrong path. But to launch early with a kind of caveat and a slight apology of this is this is a bit rough and ready. But what do you think? And most people actually are hugely supportive, give feedback, say we like this, we don't like this. And you just change and change and change. And we're still changing now. And we're changing because we get feedback from consumers, but also changing because Facebook and Twitter And Instagram change all the time too. Um, so I think um, start small, change frequently and listen, really listen to what your customers are saying. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you. 
And what advice would you give instead to people who are applying for entry-level positions in digital departments in publishing? So when you say digital departments, what kind of departments would you include um, there? Audience, digital development, e-books, um, audiobooks. Audiobooks, yeah. something like that. I think it's most important to sort of walk the walk. I think you, obviously, if you're interested in audiobooks, you need to be listening to audiobooks. And likewise with e-books. Um, and digital marketing, you know, to go into a digital marketing role but not have your own social media accounts and be really active and engaged yeah. in them. And more than just listening, I think you, you need to understand how people respond and what is appropriate and inappropriate behaviour. And we've seen it. We've just recently set up a, a Facebook group rather than a Facebook page and people post stuff without engaging with the group and the group don't like that. They like you to engage first and then if you want to post something, particularly if it's self-promotion in some way, um, then they're more understanding. If you just come in straight away with some kind of promotional post, they they tend not to comment. Um, so I think, you know, whichever area you're interested in getting into, you need to be active in in that in that area. Um, my my big thing for digital is metadata, which is the tedious end of digital, but so so important, and I think still undervalued um, by publishers. I still see. A lot of errors in the in the Nielsen metadata, whether it's not being consistent in what you call a series or the numbering of a series or the, um, you know, how you refer to the author, you know, whether it's J.K. Rowling, J. K. Rowling, J. Space, K. Space Rowling, um, you know, you really have to be consistent because what you want is for someone online to click and see the series name or the author name or the genre and see the full offering that you can give them. And the metadata is not, not the reason any of us went into publishing, but I still think uh, that's where a lot of the focus focus needs to be still. And uh, you can have the fanciest marketing campaign in the world, but if you can't actually find the book online, uh, it's, it's a wasted effort. Yeah, absolutely. And what would you say are the most important skills to develop for a career in digital publishing? I don't know if the skills for digital publishing are wholly different to regular publishing in that, you know, obviously if you want to go into marketing, you need to be interested in, in the message and the audience, etc. And if you want to go into uh, digital publishing, you know, e-books, you know, there's obviously you need to have an interest in editing and copywriting and attention to detail, etc. Um, you obviously need to be comfortable with digital media. Um, you need to be reading, as I've said, if you if you want to be working ebooks, you really need to be someone who who um, engages with ebooks and downloads them frequently. Um, I think on on social, you know, you need to be someone who's perhaps looking for trends, someone who would tap into hashtags or moments um, and to do it genuinely rather than it feeling like an effort, basically. Um, and then I think, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of process in publishing to manage uh, all the different books so you have to be extremely well organized and probably comfortable with spreadsheets and systems and processes but again I think that's true whether you're in digital publishing or uh, outside of digital pub publishing but in in the industry in general that will never uh, do you any harm an organization juggling all these different campaigns will help whatever field you're in yeah absolutely and how did you understand that you were ready to found your own company and what advice would you give to someone who would love to do the same? <laughs> I'm not sure I ever knew I was quite ready to, to found my own company. I think when we look around at other people who've set up their own things, we often think that they're somehow endowed with either the perfect skill set or the moment when they knew. And I think it, it is a risk and it, it is a hunch. I think a lot of people who start their own business have always known that they wanted to do it. And I would say that's true of me in that I always thought I want to do this. I don't know what it is, but there's some business that I would like to run. Um, and I looked at the indie authors when I was at Apple who were doing a phenomenal job of promoting their own books without access to the retailers, as it, as it were. And at the time, a lot of publishers was, were saying, you know, we really feel like we're powerless. It's up to the retailers, which books are promoted, etc., etc. And here were these indie authors selling in phenomenal quantities just through hard work and constant promotion and making sure the channels were covered. Uh, and, and I really thought that actually anyone with drive, determination, persistence, 
can get their book known. And I, I could see that there was a gap in the market, a, a, a space where parents were looking for book recommendations for children and publishers didn't have a huge number of places where they felt they could both safely and um, confidently promote children's books very reliant on newspaper reviewers or um, or bloggers and basically you were then in a big pile and it was whether they got to the bottom of the pile and got to your book so it was a bit of a sort of a Russian roulette um, and there are some fantastic bloggers around and, and understandably they are inundated with books so I wanted to provide a platform that was a little more democratic but also um, had children at the heart rather than adults I mean I love children's books and my children love children's books and there's some crossover but there isn't always crossover they like different types of books to the ones that I like um, so I knew that there was a gap in the market uh, I'd seen how Goodreads had done it very successfully obviously in the adult market it worried me slightly that they hadn't done it in children's I wonder if there was something they knew that I didn't but at the same time they hadn't really targeted children so there was there was a moment I thought if I don't do it now someone else is going to do it. And so I just made a leap of faith. But there's never, it's a bit like having children, I don't think there's ever a perfect moment to start mm -hmm. your own business. There's always an argument for and against. Definitely. And talking about children's books, what are the most interesting trends in children's literature this year? This year, I think middle grade is still storming. I mean, it's hugely popular. It's very interesting to see on our platform They're not just reviewed by children. There's a lot mm -hmm. that are reviewed by adults, librarians, uh, teachers, grandparents, children's book enthusiasts. Um, and that is actually a bit of a challenge for us because we really want the opinions of children and sometimes we just get the opinion of adults. Um, aside from middle grade, I think for me the most interesting one this year is graphic novels. Mm -hmm. And I, I can see... Um, some of the publishers are doing their own and you've got fantastic series like Alex Ryder or Artemis Fowl that are having graphic novel uh, versions made but there's also um, there's the classic comic store they've got this classic illustrated series so it's like Treasure Island and um, Oliver Twist of sort of graphic novels and I think that's yeah. really interesting and I think uh, I'm hoping I can see a slight softening there was this sort of feeling that if children weren't reading long books with long words by established authors then they weren't reading proper books and people seem to be beginning to understand that actually as long as children are reading for pleasure then it's a good thing absolutely and kids love illustrations my son is 11 he will read harry potter but equally he loves the treehouse story series from macmillan because it's got brilliant illustrations and he loves Uh, long fiction titles with illustrations in and he loves graphic novels and I think particularly if you're struggling to find a, a series or an author for children mixing up a bit and trying graphic novels or magazines or newspapers um, different books is a great way to get them interested and I think just going back to, to your question about what was the mission for Tops I think children sometimes think they love reading or they hate reading I don't like reading I'm more into football or whatever And really, if you can get a child to read widely, you can say to them, well, you might not like that book, but try this book. You didn't like that author. You don't like their style, but try this style. And try not to think of them as liking or disliking reading, but liking or disliking specific books. And I think that's what I like about the whole process with Top Steve, children writing a review. It's often when they're writing the review, they start to understand what they did or didn't like about it and therefore how they would find their next book if they didn't like it they didn't like it because it didn't have any pictures okay yeah. well find a book with pictures um but if they did like it well okay what other books are similar to this one either in the same series by the same author or the same genre um and it helps them understand what their tastes are and that reading is yeah. all about finding your thing rather than liking or disliking it in some way and that was really important to me and quite a revelation i don't think i realized that at the start yeah Yeah, that's really important. And what about specific themes or topics? I've noticed, for example, there are a lot more um, books for children with environmental-friendly yeah. topics. Absolutely. Have you noticed that as well or any other? Um, Certainly in the environment, yeah. there have been quite a few books and it's interesting to see how it's approached for different ages and it's clearly an important topic. And I think, you know, parents as well as children are looking for ideas of how to help the planet in a scalable way so that it's manageable for them. I think that sometimes with climate, 
the discussions around climate change, people feel helpless. There's nothing they can do. And these books are fantastic, fantastic because they say to the children, you can do this. Don't use a plastic bottle that you throw away. Use a reusable plastic yeah. bottle or try not to use so much cling film or... Uh, if we get a takeaway, what happens to that to those plastic boxes? Um, you know, why do you think we're getting snow in March? W what about the forest fires in Australia? And it's to get them thinking about it. And we we really need to make some changes for for this next generation and future generations if we want to see the world to continue. Um, so certainly, the environment has been one. I think mental health. We've got some fantastic books for mental health. Um, whether it's Matthew Saeed, you know, you are awesome. And we've got a wonderful book um, coming through for our January Tops to Book Club, When Sadness Comes to Call by Eva Ayland, which is all about, it's a picture book for a start, about what happens when children might feel a bit down or a bit sad and how they tackle that. But I think it's also useful for a parent who perhaps has a child who's feeling a bit sad and how they tackle that and just allowing this feeling to, to land and be present and not to be scared of it or and not to uh, try and cover it up but to sort of talk about it accept it and wait for it to pass and I think to convey that in a picture book is is an extraordinary talent um, so there's a whole variety of books from picture books through to reference books through to activity books um, and I'm sure into sort of middle grade and fiction as well really looking at uh, climate change or mental health um, and that can only be a good thing, you know, uh, compared to, say, the colouring uh, phenomena of a few years back, which um, seems to have passed now. I really hope that these these themes continue on because they're clearly very important and long term issues for us to work with as a as a generation. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned the Top Star Book Club. Yes. Which is another great initiative. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, we have, um, again, we get submissions from publishers and they can be anything from picture book, reference book, uh, fiction, right there up to sort of, I guess, upper primary. And we have four books and we let people choose which one would be talked about. And we have a, a session on the last Wednesday of the month for an hour, which are questions about the book and then uh, time to ask the author a few questions as well. And it's, it's is a, it on Twitter? It's on what? Twitter, sorry, yes, absolutely. It's on Twitter. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to be on Twitter because obviously that's the industry place and we get a lot of authors and we get librarians and teachers there. Um, I think what it probably doesn't quite do is sort of chat to our parents or our children, but these are the gatekeepers and obviously are in hugely important um, places in terms of their influence with, with children. I and mean, people talk about influences on youtube or instagram and i just think blimey publishing has been doing this for years with librarians librarians and teachers that these are the influences in our industry um and i think it's it's wonderful the engagement that we get around this book and i'm really excited about this picture book at the end of the month as well uh, because people come up with such interesting questions and to have the opportunity to ask the author directly i think is wonderful rather than you know hoping that they might come near your hometown for an author event, you know, particularly with bookshops disappearing from our high streets. I think it's a lovely way, again, of people who perhaps don't have local bookshops or libraries or launch events or, or author events near them to be able to engage in this bookish world without actually leaving leaving their house. So it's it's been lots of fun to do. Absolutely. And Last question, which book are you reading at the moment and mm. what has been your favourite of 2019? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, well, at the moment I am reading The Kid Who Came From Space, which is Ross Welford, and we love his book. So I'm reading that with my son and that's tons of fun. It's all about time travel. Um, last last year, ooh, I'm assuming you're talking about children's, not adults, or you either. You could choose uh, anything, I choose even one more each. than one. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's a tough one. Um in terms of adult, it was Olive Ketteridge, so Elizabeth Stratton, okay. which I just loved and I was late to. And um, I've just been given Olive again, so I'm very much yeah. looking forward to that. Um, and she was a bit of a revelation. I'd obviously heard about Olive Ketteridge, but had not read, read it and loved it to bits. And I've been telling everyone and buying it everyone for Christmas. So that was probably my favourite adult book. In terms of children, I think it would have to be Malamanda, which was a wonderful book from Thomas Taylor and... Um, 
I believe he was the illustrator for Harry Potter books before he started writing and he's a natural and it's such a lovely series with these really quirky interesting characters and he just I could visualize the place so so easily and it's really it's a magical world and it's it's a little bit scary but it's not too scary for children and it was just a really good yarn and he's got another book coming out this year Gargantis which again there's a lot of excitement because our community um, loved Malamanda so much they're really now looking forward to the second book and that's what I love doing I like you, you find a book that the child connects with and then you hold their hand and you take them onto the next book whether it's uh, the same author a different author the same series a different series um, and, and it, it's full of surprises um, talking of surprises I discovered uh, far later than everyone else how good Skullduggery Pleasant series was and I'd always looked at it and thought it was looked a bit scary or uh, was for older children and really it's a fantastic series if your kids like Harry Potter and I we've now sort of raced through the whole series and we're right the way up to um, book 13 which is coming out this year um, so I love the fact that you can still discover new books you know we have uh, I think it's 10,000 new children's books every year so there's if you don't like a well. book yeah there's plenty of other choice for you to choose from uh, but those I think would be my favourite Perfect. Thank you. That was my last question. Thank you very much for your time and advice. It was really a pleasure. Not at all. Lovely to be here. Thank you very much for having me on. Thank you. That is all for this episode of Publishing Insight. I hope you enjoyed listening to it and found it useful. If so, please subscribe, leave a review and recommend it to a friend. If you'd like to learn more about children's publishing, you can listen to the second episode of season one, where I interview Christine Modaferi. If you'd like to learn more about digital publishing, you can listen to episode seven of season one, where I interview John Campbell. You can find these links in the description box, along with my email address, website, and social media handles. Have a nice day, and I'll see you in the next episode.